Hello and welcome to episode three of Giant Mess, a show for Giants and Mets fans who enjoy a little bit of this and a little bit of that. On today's show, we're going to talk about Barstool Sports, rough and rowdy. How did that go down? Were there any difficulties of the technical kind? (laughs) Yeah. We'll talk about the end of season two for The Sopranos and the beginning of season three. New trailers for Brad Pitt's space movie, Top Gun Maverick, and Tom Hanks as Mr. Rogers. The roller coaster ride that was this week in Mets baseball. Plus, Matt Harvey getting DFA'd. The passing of Giants former offensive lineman Mitch Petras. The GQ feature on OBJ. Baker Mayfield's comments. And a whole lot more. So let's get it started. Friday night, Barstool Sports live streamed their Rough and Rowdy 9 event. It took place in Fayetteville, North Carolina, also known as Fayette Nam, I guess. I used to live down in North Carolina for a hot New York minute. Down in a place called Lenore, North Carolina. It was kind of 20 to 30 minutes outside of Charlotte. Um, was there long enough to see a gun rack and discovered trampolines. That's where I tried to do a backflip and severely fucked up my knee. Also played uh, video games against a neighbor who was missing all the fingers on his hands. Still beat the shit out of me. Shout out to that kid. Forgot his name. Hopefully this gets to him and he can reach out and tell me how he's still dominating the world of esports. It's probably rich out of his mind. Uh, yeah, so rough and rowdy. I didn't catch it on Friday night and ended up watching it in full on Monday. It was the first rough and rowdy event I've seen, and uh, I was impressed. I don't think it was their best effort. It was the first broadcast, rough and rowdy broadcast without Dave. And I think, uh, you know, there was still some kinks to work out. They had Big Cat, they had Large, and they had Robbie Fox on commentary. And, uh, I don't think the fans really got what they want for most of the evening. I know the heavyweight championship was kind of a disappointment. The middleweight championship, kind of a disappointment. And uh, a lot of slaps, a lot of slapping going on. I think uh, maybe the ring girls didn't really put on the show that everyone was expecting. Um, Still entertaining to watch. I mean, four hours of content. There were something like 30 some odd boxing matches. Uh, if you don't have Barstool Hardcore or Softcore membership, might be worth your time just for the Rough and Rowdy events alone. Those are included. Uh, but overall, if I had to give it a grade, C plus, B minus, I don't know that you're going to have a lot of people talking about it in the weeks to come. Uh, I, I don't think they had any Barstool personalities performing or fighting in it. So... It was, uh, the theme was red, white, and bruised, had a military feel to it. I think it was, uh, at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. Um, so you had some interesting characters for sure. And that's why we tune in. It's not for, uh, the athleticism. Although the one guy does a backflip in the middle of the ring, which is pretty dope. Um, you can pull that off, but then it's like, you're, are you a one trick pony? You're just going to do a backflip every, every match and people are going to expect that. And then you don't give it to them. And then here come the boo birds. But uh, they had some technical difficulties to start off the show, as Barstool commonly does. And that's the Barstool difference, if you're familiar with the the brand. Um, apparently, half an hour went by where they just couldn't get the live stream up and running. And fans started booing. They wanted the fights to start. I think maybe the highlight of the night has to be the Cup Snake. If you're following Barstool, if you're following baseball, you know that the Cup Snake... Uh, that's going on at Wrigley Field. It's getting shut down by security, by the ushers repeatedly. Uh, and and I think even one security guy or usher got fired for being coming out and being against it and going on a Barstool Sports Chicago podcast or show. Uh, Ligma Balsack is the guy's username, screen name. I don't know. But uh, he gets canned, which is unfortunate. And now there's a, a movement um, against the Chicago Cubs, uh, I guess, stadium staff, you know, to rehire him or to get justice pretty much. But the cup snake going on at rough and rowdy, very long, very strong. And of course the policy at the stadium, at the venue, according to security, we don't have a policy. It's probably for the best. You don't want to cause any kind of riots and no fights in the crowd this time around. I know there have been some in the past, none so far uh, at this rough and rowdy. Um, very close to having one as uh, 
a gentleman was very anti-Trump and was very vocal about that in North Carolina, which I assume is a red state. I don't know. So maybe that'll come to fruition in the next rough and rowdy. Looking forward to that. So last week was kind of a wash. Tuesday through Friday tried to export a video, the video of episode two, and it did not work. Didn't think it was going to come around. Didn't think it was actually going to happen. I can bore you with the details, tell you how this happened, that happened. People tune out pretty quick, so we're going to skip over that part. (laughs) We're going to talk about the trip down to Bowie, Maryland. I went to college in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I don't want to name the college. If you know me, you know the college, but you know, the whole you know, BuzzFeed said, you know, what, what, how did your family pay for college? And I wrote back with their lives and they did, you know, my father passed, my grandmother passed. And I was finally able to, you know, with the money that comes from their passing, pay off my debt. If not, I would have been in debt to 76, 72 years old. So not, not really high on college right now. But anyway, I went to school down in Baltimore, Maryland. We went down to Bowie, Maryland to visit some friends. They just had a baby, so we wanted to visit the baby. Spent some quality time there. They just got a new house. Excellent. And I think the highlight from that trip, other than the fact that it takes so goddamn long to get down there, I think it's supposed to be like four hours, but it was like everyone was on the road, especially in this heat wave, which is outrageous. Like if there's a heat wave, you need to stay inside. And we tried to stay inside for the most part, but you know, shit happens. And you know, on the way down there, we go to McDonald's. It's breeze. My daughter's first trip to McDonald's, her first taste of fast food at its best, at its finest. She got, we put a fry in her mouth and her world changed. I mean, the level of salt they have on those fries is outrageous. And she got a taste and you could see it was like that scene in Requiem for a Dream where the person's like iris or retina gets real wide. Like, oh boy, I just hit the jackpot. This is going to be my life from now on. So hopefully she's not that hooked already at 10 months. If she is, I mean, you're watching this, you're scarred for life and I apologize. Uh, but so the trip down went, I guess, fairly smoothly as, as it can go on a Friday afternoon. I think what was really, <laughs> would really put a damp in our plans or crimp in our plans was the fact that I showered and I shaved and I look in the mirror in the bathroom, which is not the best mirror. And I look in the mirror in the shower, not the best mirror. And I'm thinking I'm good to go. I nailed it. 100%. I got every single hair there is. I didn't. We show up to her daycare, Brielle's daycare to pick her up. My wife doesn't tell me that I have missed several spots to the point where I look like an insane person. Like the asylum is looking for one of its residents. I missed the, the, the hairs right here underneath the nostrils. I missed the, the hairs lining the lip. And there's just a big old chunk on the chin that I just did completely. I don't know how, but it just couldn't cut it down. What's amazing about the under the nostrils and the lips, it's just like the, it's a single file line of hairs. Like the hairs are like, you know, it's, it's like when, you know, there's some some kind of fight going on in the room. And everyone just kind of backs up against the walls. Those hairs saw the, the blades coming and they're like, whoop. And they just kind of press themselves against the wall. Like that ride, the Gravitron at an amusement park. That's essentially what the, what those hairs did. And they survived until I caught them. You know, you start to feel your face and you're like, ah, okay. Yeah. Definitely need to do this over. So we had to come back here, touch up real quick. And I felt a thousand times better. All because of hair. It's just hair. But you look like a crazy person when you don't do it right. So we got a late start on the road. And we didn't get down there until about 8.30. And, I mean, you know, standard visit. Talking about birth stories and babies and what to expect and do you miss anything. But I think the big takeaway from the weekend was this dog that they have. Our friends. Kind of a big dog. And it's kind of an anxious dog. (laughs) And Bree, she's not used to dogs. 
All right. We, we introduced her to her first dog a couple of weeks ago, a small dog. She immediately started crying. Like, what is this thing and why is it coming at me? You see, the two cats we have here in the room, in the house, they skedaddle. They get the hell out of the way when they see Brie coming. Not the dogs. The dogs come to her and that freaks her out. So the small dog, very small, smaller than her, that got her on edge. So you can imagine what this big dog, who's almost my size, coming at her, did to her psyche. Again, we're scarring her for life. So she cried upon meeting this dog, but eventually she became obsessed and wouldn't leave the dog alone. And for a dog that's tweaking, riddled with anxiety, to not just viciously attack this little baby, weakless, weak, defenseless, vulnerable baby, not tear its face off, kudos to that dog. Because that was an anxious dog. How anxious? Great question. This dog refused to go into the kitchen. Just avoided it at all costs. We had to keep the two doors to the bathroom open so we could use the bathroom to circumvent the kitchen. Something went down in that kitchen, okay? You don't have to tell me twice. And once it comes into the front room from the back room through the bathroom, it backs into the front room so it can keep an eye on the kitchen. Now, if you're like me, you have the same thought that I did. And I asked them, I asked the owners, do you think there's a ghost in the kitchen? Because I 100% think there's a ghost there. And of course they laughed and they said, oh, my sister and my mother, they think the same thing. So ridiculous. And I'm like, is it though? Is it dogs, animals? They can sense evil, but they can sense ghosts. There's definitely for sure a ghost in that kitchen. And they went on to explain they said, well, you know, I guess, uh, yeah, the previous owner did was an old woman and she did die in the, in the kitchen or something like that in the house. And I'm like, yeah, it's her ghost. She's got some unsettled business and this dog doesn't want any part of it. Maybe it wasn't an old woman because they also have some creepy old tool shed in the backyard. Why is it creepy? Well, there's a small window and it's in the corner and it's at a certain height for a certain person to look out of. And it's pointed directly at an elementary school. Okay. Now, I hate to jump to conclusions, but whoever lives in that house was a perv and they're probably paying for it now in purgatory. And this dog has to deal with it. So, stinks for that dog. And I'm wishing him the best. Let's move on to TV. Actually, you know, let's go back. Sorry. I mean, they were lovely hosts. I mean, th the food we had there was just outstanding. I'm officially a fan of sour beers now. I was on a shandy kick for a while. If you saw my social media, you saw that I, I professed my undying love to Dell's shandy by Narragansett. I mean, that's a match made in heaven, If you're, especially if you're from Rhode Island. Shout out to all my roadies. Um, but now I might be on a sour beer kick. I don't know. I might be. I had one down in Bowie. <laughs> And I don't want to say it changed my life, but it definitely improved my life. You know, I didn't know I needed it. And now I do at all times. I also happened to order a bottle, a three bottle variety pack of Brine Brothers. Pickle Brine? Didn't know I needed that in my life. But I watched Big Brain, Arsenal Sports version of Shark Tank. And they had these Brine Brothers guys on. And, you know, John Taffer's impressed. The guy from Body Armor's impressed. Dave's impressed. They're thinking about investing. Went on, ordered a three-pack. Thought, let's give it a shot. And I tried it. I even handed it as a gift to these hosts that were hosting us down in Bowie. Which, it's, it's spelled Bowie. Like David Bowie. But you gotta say Bowie. If you say Bowie, you might end up in a farm somewhere without your head. So buoy everybody, but the brine brothers, natural pickle brine has multiple uses. I know I'm sounding like a commercial, no free ads, but it's actually pretty impressive stuff. It's the most multifunctional. I'm big into multitasking and being multifunctional. It's what my career has been for the past 15 years. Good God. This pickle brine is good for hangovers, pre-workout, post-workout for pickling, obviously. You mix it in a drink, you make pickleback shots. I mean, it's it's got it all. So I gave that as a gift. They didn't open it. They didn't want to open it. So I'm pretty sure that's getting tossed the moment we left that place. But I'm having it right now, mixed with some uh, luxury Polish vodka that some rando 
turned us on to at the liquor store. That's another thing. You go to the liquor store, you go to the grocery store and you have random strangers come up to you and just give their unsolicited input. Unsolicited. Didn't ask for it. I know you overheard me questioning myself. You know, we were looking at Tito's and we're saying, you know, goddamn, we've been drinking Tito's 10 years straight now. Is it time for a change? Is that something that we need to entertain? And this guy was like, hey, you like Tito's, huh? And it's like, where did you come from? With the balls on you to pop into a random conversation. And he suggested this luxury Polish vodka. Cannot pronounce it. It's triple distilled. Luxo Juana. Luxo Juana. I don't know. It's been around since 1922. This is the first time I've heard of it. And it's good. I don't think it says... Has a uh, you know, Tito's gets a little too warm. You're like, yeah, it's got that weird taste. This doesn't have it. Smooth, dangerously smooth. So I mix that with some pickle brine, and that's what I'm consuming right now. And it took a little while to get used to. And that's that's you know my taste buds are on their deathbed. Like they're it's a dying breed. My taste buds. So like I make drinks super strong because the first the first sip it's like all right that sucked but i know the taste buds they're going night night okay and then uh, and then i just can power through it because the taste buds have decided to quit on me and that's kind of what's going on with this pickle brine it's like at first you're like who i don't know maybe i did a little too much of the pickle brine and then you kind of settle in the ice starts to melt and you're like all right you start to get in a groove um yeah, so they definitely tossed that for sure, right? There's no way they kept that, which is unfortunate because I think it's it's worth a try. Brian Brothers, check it out. Maybe I'll get some uh, kickback on that. I don't know. Free product. Hello. On the way back from Bowie, took forever, five plus hours. We went to Burger King. So that's two fast food joints in one weekend. You know, usually we want to kind of compact that, condense it into one day and have a fat kid day. But we decided it's a weekend where we deserve it. Go to Burger King. And I got to say, I used to be a Mickey Days guy as a kid growing up. But now I'm starting to think Burger BK is the place to be. I think that switch came right around college. It was like, whoa, this flame broiled stuff. Maybe that's something I got to get on board with. And if I'm being if we're being honest, trust tree, circle of trust. I think BK has got the edge. And McDonald's fries maybe have jumped the shark. I know. I take uh, m- all my takes are lukewarm. By by the way, by the way, BT dubs. My takes are luke, as I like to call them. They're warm, like a chocolate chip cookie out of the oven. Um, almost saw so many accidents. I mean, you, you know, you're driving for multiple hours. You're you're bound to see one or two. And the best part about seeing an accident, I mean, you know, God forbid is that I always comment on the, on the near accident or the accident that happened. And it's a guarantee that whenever I comment on the accident, I'm bound to almost get into one almost immediately. It's like the traffic gods are like, oh, you think that's cool? Check this out. Oh, you think that's so unavoidable? You question how it could ever happen? Now it's happening to you. I mean, traffic, right? Top five things I don't understand might be the top thing I don't understand. You slow down to almost a complete stop and you're looking ahead because the road curves. So you're looking ahead and you're like, there's nothing up there. There's just space to roam. Oh, the freedom. It's amazing. And you're wondering why is what, what's this? And I've watched videos about this YouTube videos where it's like explains traffic. And I still don't understand how it happens especially on a four lane highway and how the New Jersey turnpike is it gets down to two lanes at one point. What are we doing here? What are we doing? What, who, who do I have to pay? What petition do I have to sign to, to bounce that out to four or five lanes? What is the purpose of that? Especially when the exits every 30 miles, good God. And that's my traffic rant. Um, yeah, so I guess on Sunday this happened or over the weekend, a comedian made a joke about XXX Tentacion, who is a rapper who was murdered in cold blood. Uh, from what I've read and seen, I'm not a fan, but he's he's done some pretty horrible shit. 
but uh, he did get murdered. And this comedian, female comedian, I don't know why I had to specify that. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know if it's a dude comedian. Does this happen? She makes a, a joke about a, a good joke about his murder saying like, he's this rapper. He was in a car and he was going with $50,000 on cash in him, cash on him. And he got robbed, shot, and the cash was stolen from him. And she says, uh, that's a great commercial for Venmo. You know, I butchered the joke, but like you get it. The punchline is if he had Venmo, would he still be alive? <laughs> and I'm laughing and you know, death's not funny, but the guy was a real piece of shit. Apparently really, he beat up his, uh, girlfriend slash wife, mother of his kid. Um, but I think KFC from Barstool had a really good line on this on Twitter. He said, Hey, I hate people. And this is from his blog that he wrote about it. He said, I hate people who cry about being too insensitive about someone's death and then send death threats to the person they've never met. I mean, that's just really encapsulates our culture, mostly online culture. And I've wanted to do stand a bit about death threats because it's like, if you get enough of the death threats and nothing happens, you become immune to it, but it's still a death threat. So it's like, which ones do you take seriously? That's a tough one. And that's why I don't ever want to get famous. I'm not looking, I'm not doing this to get fame because I don't want the death threats. I think you just get death threats if you're famous, no matter who you are. Tom Hanks probably has had gotten at least one death threat in his life. But, you know, he takes that one very seriously. If you get millions of death threats, it's like, eh, I get this shit all the time. It's just people talking. But if who, who are you if you were giving the death threat? I mean, I've been threatened. I don't know if it's a death threat. I used to work for a website, men's lifestyle and entertainment website. Wrote an article about Philadelphia sports teams, how they have the worst fans. You know, just trying to get those clicks, trying to get those page views. And I had a bunch of instances, incidents where, you know, Philly sports fans didn't come off looking that great. And uh, yeah, I got threats. I mean, a lot of the stuff that they were writing in response to me was very funny. And that's why I, always, I will always have a place in my heart for, for Philadelphia and Philadelphia sports fans. Um, but the one guy said, you know, if you ever come into Philly, I'm, I'm punching you. <laughs> I'm punching you in the face or something to that effect. Watch your back. So it wasn't like you're going to die. But like the moment you step foot in Philadelphia, you you will be attacked. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that guy's serious, right? So I shouldn't take this seriously. Of course, I did take it seriously just because that's who I am. I, for, I just lose my sense of humor for a split second. My rage kicks in. You know, I went in all in on him. And then he's saying like, you know, I went all in on this picture. His avatar is him with a, a woman. Uh, I made a comment about the woman. He says that woman has cancer. It's like, all right, we're playing this game now. Like you were just giving me death threats and it just devolved from there. You know, we go into that whole scoreboard thing. Well, I have this and you have that and I have this and you have that. And it's just like, where is this going? But like, if you're the kind of person that gives death threats, like give me a call 862 BIT 1986, or just hit me up on social media. Just let me know. Like, have you ever followed through on the death threat? Or is it just like, I want to put the fear of death into someone. Death threats, dude. And is anyone taking that, like, I, FBI, do they really, CIA, are they working on that? Is that part of their plan? Like, we gotta, uh, we gotta address this. You can't just be willy-nilly doling out death threats. I mean, you, you gotta think that Kevin Durant, with all his burner accounts, has probably <laughs> sent a death threat or two. That's why I think in the future, the internet, you, everyone has to be verified before they can actually use the internet. Like you have to provide your face, phone number, email, license. That's just the future. The future is scary. Um, we've been, uh, so moving on to TV. So we, I've been mentioning here and there. I don't know if it's been the ones that were, are recorded, the ones that I had to, to trash, but the Sopranos. Okay. 
we finished season two and it's amazing how I can be so out on a series. And literally it's that quote from Al Pacino and they pull me right back in. So right. The second to last episode of the Sopranos in season two. Okay. It ends on like this weird kind of light note, right? They're outside of Sartre Alley's. There's an accident and like the, and Syl and the other guy go over and they're like bitching out the guy who got in the accident, but it's all very, very playful. And then the feds approach and they're talking, they're shooting the shit with Tony. And then just kind of does that peel back fade away. And you're just like, what the fuck did I just watch? What, where is the series going? Why do people think this series is so great? I do not get it. And then the very next episode, Janice shoots Richie and you're like, okay, all in. You got me right back in. I boomeranged. I yo-yoed. Uh, you know, I, did I see it coming? I, I saw it right before it happened. I was like, okay, she's handling this. She's in shock. She just got punched in the grill. I think we all are, would be in that same state of just like, what the fuck just happened? And she calmly just turned around. And when she, she turned around and walked away and he's kind of all like, yeah, whatever. Fuck it. I'm the man of the house. And she comes slowly walking back in. I was like, shit is going down. She points the gun. I'm thinking, does Janice have it in her? You know, she's got that soprano blood. Is, did she inherit this murderous part of her family lineage? Yeah, she did big time. Shot to the heart, shot to the face, I think. And then her crying over the body. So Italian. <laughs> And I'm a quarter Italian, so I feel like I, I'm 25% justified in saying this, but like the ama- it's amazing, like the flip of the switch from happy to sad, angry to calm, joking to serious. Like the fact that she just shot him and she was like, was stone faced when she did it and then is now crying and weeping over his body. Is that real? You know, Janice, man, what an addition. I don't know if I was, if I approved the, for her first couple appearances, I was like, oh, what is her deal? Like she just wants the estate. Like she's borderline annoying. And then now she's, she's back from Seattle and it's like, uh, she's the foil. She's the heel. She is like here to just fuck Tony shit up and be as disruptive as possible. And just be, all over the map, you know, diabolical Janice, such a great addition. I was on the fence and now I'm no longer on the fence. Now I saw the ringer posted something about the most annoying kids from TV shows. And I think AJ, uh, Anthony Soprano Jr. Made that list. He was in the featured image. So I assume he's in the list. I didn't, I didn't bother clicking through, but is he really that annoying? Like, yeah. Okay. He's a little annoying, but like, it's not so pervasive. It's just like here and there, like what's up your ass type of thing. I don't think it's that grading annoying that you might see with like Jesus Christ, Livia. And at certain points, Janice, where you're like, why is this part of the show? Is it just to get me riled up and ruffle my feathers? If so, kudos, congratulations. But I mean, I kind of feel for AJ, you know, and maybe this is why, (laughs) you know, I'm delusional. I need to get my head on straight because I'm not as likable as I think I might be. You know, it, 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 it wavers. There are days where I'm like, yeah, I'm the shit. And the other days where I'm like, I am a piece of shit. So I, I've been in AJ's shoes where you're like, you're going through puberty, weird shit's going down around you. You feel like you don't have a voice. You're not really an adult, but you're not really a kid. So I don't know. I empathize with the guy. Maybe he does get more annoying. You know, there are points where the parents are obviously reaching out to him and he's just kind of being a, a lump, a lump of coal. And you're like, all right, I get it. But that's kind of like what kids are like then. I mean, there are times where Meadow was just so, <sighs> Like, good God. I'm looking forward to that with Brielle. Just like the moment that she just turns on me. And I'm like, oh, that moment of realization. Like, yep. This is my life for the next four, 
years. Superb. I think it's ironic that Tony's panic attacks are caused by meat. But then they give the backstory and you're like, yeah, I could see that. And then, of course, AJ now is going through the panic attacks because now he's he was called a leader at football practice. But how does that tie into like Tony obviously had the panic attacks because he saw his dad cut up that dude's pinky at the deli shop where there's meat everywhere. And he sees his dad cutting into the meat at home, reminds him of the pinky, passes out. So it's like, I get that. The leader comment that causes AJ to pass out, he doesn't want to be his dad, but yet he goes to visit Meadow at college and he doesn't really, he doesn't see himself fitting in with that vibe. So he's like, I don't want to go to college, which reminded me of just that generation of parents they were like, you have to go to college. College is a must. Like, what do you do? Not go to college? It's like, yeah, not go to college. Looking back, should I have gone to college? Probably not. Do you learn a lot of life lessons? Yeah, sure. But there, I almost feel like, and I know this is trying to play the victim, but I feel like there should be more responsibility placed on the colleges to prepare you for life. And not set, and not bury you in debt. So if you're a science, technolo- technology, engineering, mathematics, STEM, yeah, college makes sense. You need that. Want to be a doctor? Yeah. Want to be a lawyer? Okay. Professions that require a lot of expertise, knowledge. I get that. College makes sense. Not for some Joe Schmo like me. Just wants to shoot the shit on camera about the Giants and Mets. Does that require six figures of debt? I don't know. I I could not have gone to college, watch a bunch of YouTube videos, read a bunch of articles, and I'm still in the same place. Now, maybe I'm a, a, a a social hermit who lives in a cave. Okay, I get it. So when he's like, I don't want to go to college, and they're so emphatic about college, it's like, I hear you, AJ. Does that make me, I feel like I'm annoying by proxy now because I'm siding with AJ. Um, it really threw me off with that scene with Olivia in season three, where it's like so obviously special effects. And you're like, why are they doing this? It just like blew me away. Like something's weird. And of course I look it up and she, the actress of unfortunately passed away like the summer before they started filming. So I guess they felt like that was their tribute or they had to do that, which I, you know, you could argue for or against it. I don't know. Um, but you wonder how much that uh, affected the storyline, you know, like did she have a bigger part down the line, season three, four, five, whatever. And now it's like, they got to completely overhaul because of her passing. Um, I don't know. I just, that was starting to wear on me too. It's like, how much more of this have we got to do? There was a lot of her in season one. It was just like, and I, and I get it. They wanted you to put you in Tony's shoes, right? And say, Hey, you want to know why Tony's this fucking psychopath with racist tendencies? (laughs) It's this chick. But like how much, blame can you put on the parents apparently you can put a lot because that's why tony's in therapy and having panic attacks and whatnot but um you know i'm sad that she passed but i think for the sake of the show they they really did need to move on um is big pussy really dead this is where i didn't look it up i was like i I avoided i try i almost did and then because like okay tony in the finale he has those fever dreams caused by the food poisoning or whatever and it, he reveals pretty much to himself, his subconscious reveals that Big Pussy has been working with the feds and he's the rat. I thought it was very symbolic that he's in the fever dream. Big Pussy is like a, a fish on ice. So when you, when, and this is goes, ties in with mafia, so terminology, but like to put someone on ice, they whack the person, right? And swimming with the fishes, another thing that they say when they dump your body. So a fish on ice. It's like, yeah, big pussy's got it coming to him. I didn't, I mean, I didn't really follow the show that much, but I could have sworn that big pussy was a huge part of the storyline for the entire series. I didn't think he would get whacked in season two. 
And of course, my wife is the one who picked up on the fact that when they're at Livia's remembrance, wake, whatever, and Tony goes into the, the cabinet or the you know, cabinet to get some liquor for the guys, he opens the door. The door has a mirror on the back. And when you open it up and in the mirror, you see big pussy for a second. And Tony even kind of looks up, which is weird because it's like he's not on the other side of that mirror. Did you just sense something? I don't know. Makes me think they're going to do that whole thing where someone passes, but they keep showing up in the show as like a, you know, kind of that Macbeth type thing where it's like a, not a scenario, not necessarily a ghost, but like a premonition that kind of haunts the, the main character and is acting kind of their, is their guilty conscience that can get old pretty quick, but I don't know. Big pussy's <laughs> a pretty entertaining dude. So I guess I wouldn't mind that first season. And finally, what the fuck is Adriana doing with Christopher? What the hell is that? And I find her to be an interesting character because it's like, she's obviously attractive. Duh. And by some, is it like a self confidence thing? Ego? Like, does she not know that she could do better? But then there's, there's that part of her that is so against what she, what Christopher is doing. She's always kind of like harping at him or nipping at him or chirping at him about his mob related activities. But yet the moment he finds out that he's going to become a made man, she's like very excited for him. And I guess that's what, you know, makes the relationship so complex and dynamic and interesting is the fact that she does love him and she wants to see him succeed. If in it, even if it is in this world where, I mean, odds are you're going to jail or you're dying. I mean, those are like the two options, uh, you know. And now he's a made man and now he's kind of regretting it because he's taking over the sports book from Polly, and he's doesn't have a shit together and he's losing money and being forced to rob charities. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. This 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 little diatribe I'm doing right now about Christopher will tie in very nicely with Odell Beckham Jr. Later on the show, when I talk about his GQ feature, it's like sometimes you get what you want and it's not what you thought. A little teaser for later. Um, I did a tune. My wife loves the bachelorette. So we tuned in to the bachelorette when I was uh, working on a script last night. And this guy, uh, his name, Justin or something, Paul. I don't know. Whoa, whoa, dude. <sighs> whoa. Okay. And and that's coming from me who's had trouble letting go. I've had trouble getting closure. Um, which also ties into the OBG story OBJ story. OBG. I just want to call him OBG so bad. Uh, but like having that closure, trying to, to close yourself off and move on. Which is a theme. This is a theme that is going to be on this show and this episode. Moving on, accepting your fate, realizing that's not going to work out. You know, there's always been a part of me, whether it's sports, relationships, whatever, that there's that little thing, the little voice in the back of your head that's like, but maybe <laughs> there's a 0.0001% chance. Well, so you're saying there's a chance. Like that's constantly going on in my head. It's delusional for sure, 100%. But like, it's kind of hard to not feed into that because you figure what this, maybe if I just toss that out there, that last remaining hope, the hail Mary that you got to just have some faith in and it almost never works. It almost makes things worse. And there's that one time. <laughs> and that's what happened with this guy and Hannah. He's just showing up when he's already been kicked off the show. And he's like, I'm not leaving until I get closure. And I'm like, Okay. I've never done that. I mean, maybe I did it once. And, you know, it rhymes with mishmaning mortar. It all worked itself out. We're all for the better. No need to worry. It was, I was young. But yeah, that kind of, uh, you know, and that, that's what the producers do. They roll the dice with a lot of these personalities because a lot of them are not mentally fit to be on the show or to, to be in that kind of situation where they don't realize, like, this is not a normal dating environment. <laughs> it's like speed, speed dating on steroids, you know? 
And this guy, I don't think he could wrap his head around that. And, uh, you know, I think the physical connection that was so strong early on didn't carry through, you know, he got too, too much, too quick, too fast, which I've been there, you know, right before I missed, I met Cassie. It was like, I went too far all in on someone who wasn't reciprocating or didn't feel the same way. But in my head, I was like, this just feels right. This is it. I am so sure of it. And then you kind of go the opposite way because you don't want that to happen again. And that's how I almost lost Cassie before it even got started. Went too slow, too incommunicado. Almost, 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 almost. It's amazing how things... I never saw sliding doors with Gwyneth Paltrow, but I hear that's what it's all about. It's like these little things that you just went the other way. Who knows where you end up? All right. So movies, stuck movies. There's a new trailer for uh, Brad, P- Brad Pitt's next movie. It's called Ad Astra. No idea what that means, but plays an astronaut. His dad was an astronaut. I guess his dad played by Tommy Lee Jones goes up to space on a mission and never comes back. And so everyone thinks he's dead. Brad Pitt's like, nah, again, there's that 0.001% chance he's not dead. I'm going to explore it until I get closure. Oh man. Tying everything together very nicely right now. And so this kind of hit home for me because, you know, last week I talked about the anniversary of my father's passing. This movie is kind of about uh, a son and father relationship and Tommy Lee Jones looks like my dad. So it kind of like hit an emotional chord for me. It looks good. You know, I'm always down for space movies pretty much, you know, um, interstellar gravity. There's another one called, uh, Europa, Europia that you should check out, but not if you're hungover, cause you will get severe dread and anxiety. That's another thing. It's like, I like space movies, but at the same time, I, I, you think too much about space and you, you, you want to crawl into a hole, but it looks good. I'm definitely, uh, into it. Um, it's got like a nice little twist at the end of the trailer that will keep people interested. Uh, Top Gun Maverick the trailer released for uh, the sequel to Top Gun. Tom Cruise is back. Still looking good as ever. And, uh, the opening, uh, sequence in the trailer where he's flying super, the jet, the fighter pilot is super low to the ground. Very reminiscent of the star Wars, uh, I think it was Force Awakens, or it might have been Last Jedi when they're like super close to the ground. They're kicking up the dust behind them. It's like, hey, you know, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Uh, but uh, Ed Harris plays like, I guess, the ranking officer, and he's asking, you know, Tom Cruise, like, okay, I'm just going to rattle off all your accolades, all your accomplishments, and yet you still haven't promoted to where you should be. Why? And I thought, I mean, that is the question of the century. And I can't wait to see it. Dear God. Yeah, you can obviously tell that the windows are open when I'm recording this. Uh, the heat wave, it was like 104 at 9 p.m. And then, now, and then we got like two straight days of just torrential downpour. Just rain on rain on rain, which is really great when you're trying to pick up your infant daughter from daycare. And there was like flash flood warnings. Couldn't even see out the windshield when I'm driving. And now it's like 70 something, you know, (laughs) talk about being a yo-yo on this whole climate change thing. Very weird. What's going on with the climate and the weather. Uh, Anyway, Tom Hanks, new movie, Mr. Rogers, the Mr. Rogers movie, a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I mean, I don't think I've ever, been on the brink of crying during a trailer like I was with this. I mean, and especially on a Monday. Mondays are the worst. Shout out Garfield. And then Tom Hanks comes along with his lovable ass playing an even more lovable person in Mr. Rogers and just like him melting hearts. Even the, even the biggest of cynics had to watch that and be like, oh boy, I want to be a better person. So definitely looking forward to that. Uh, I wrote a blog post about my weekend, uh, not my weekend. I wish I had a weekend at Bernie's weekend at Bernie's 
came out in 89, July 90, uh, 1989, not 1889, popular, contrary to popular belief. So it's a 30 year anniversary. I wrote a blog post about it. It actually came out like 4th of July weekend, but you know, I figured who gives a fuck, right? Um, and it's crazy to me. I mean, you can read the whole blog post on uh, neillynch.com, but it's crazy to me that I can watch as a, like an eight or nine year old. I could, I could, when I first watched it, I can watch two guys play around the dead body for almost two hours and get all kinds of laughs out of it. But I can't bring myself as a grown ass adult to watch Swiss army man with Daniel Radcliffe who just turned 30, which blows my mind how he just turned 30. Jesus Christ. Uh, but I can't, I can't watch Swiss army man. I can't watch a guy use a dead body. In present day. But as an eight-year-old, oh yeah, toss around a mustache, dead guy, too much comedic effect. And I, I, I actually encourage everyone to rewatch it now as an adult because there's a lot of shit that you just don't notice when you're a kid. That's so subtle and layered. <sighs> just amazing. It was a I, I the title of it is My Eulogy for Weekend at Bernie's Summer's Number One Dark Comedy of the 80s. Took, it took a while to come up with that one, but you know, dark comedy, does that movie work if it's set in the winter time? You know, summer's light, jovial, everyone's out alive, feeling fresh. And then you have this dead guy, but I love the little nuances of like the crowd, the community at this, you know, this Hamptons esque location. It just, you know, the little one-liners here and there. Uh, I mean, it's worth a rewatch for sure. My Weekend at Bernie's. It's also the 10th anniversary of 500 Days of Summer. Um, I'm thinking about doing a blog post on it. Not sure. Um, it was 2009 it came out. July 2009. I saw Zoe de Chanel send out a, a tweet. It's been 3,652 days since 500 Days of Summer. I thought it was good. Uh, Kind of nice. This is before she was on New Girl. Um, and it, it just spoke to me. What can I say? You know, you th you think you have the, you watch so many movies, rom-coms in your life, and you just start to think, oh, this is the meat cute. This is where this happens. And it's like everything is scripted when it's not. And you think, okay, this is the one. This is the person. And then it doesn't work out. And, it, and you know, trying to get over that trying to work through it when you know there really isn't that ill will you know you don't have the big blow-up fight but just something's off and you think uh is this where i'm supposed to work through it is this where i'm supposed to give up and then along comes autumn still looking forward to 500 days of autumn when's that gonna happen what a cliffhanger all right so that's it for movies and tv you know, we're only 50 minutes into the friggin' show. Dear God. Uh, let's do a little This Week in Mets History. And this is where I'm supposed to have all this cool music, but I don't, I, I don't know. I don't have the time. <laughs> I don't have the time. I'm unemployed, but I don't have the time. Good job, Neil. Uh, July 21st, 1962. So this is the first year the Mets are in existence. Um, their pitcher, Craig Anderson, there's a complete game against the Reds. Uh, but loses and becomes the third consecutive Mets starter to pitch a complete game and not get a victory. So Mets fans, especially younger Mets fans, or even Mets fans my age, who weren't around in the 60s and 70s, this shit's been going on forever. The Mets are the Mets. And they lose in the Metsiest fashion impossible and that can even mean pitching three straight complete games and not getting a victory. Kind of reminiscent of what happened to them in uh, San Francisco this week, which we'll get to in a little bit. That same day, J July 21st, 1975, Mets infielder Joe Torre, who I think went on to do something with the Yankees. I don't know. Can't remember. Torre becomes the first player in National League history to hit into four straight double plays in a game. And this is after Felix Milan. Millen singles in four consecutive at bats against the Astros. If you're Felix, you're gonna be like, "Yo, what the fuck, man? You know, I'm trying to lead the way here, and you're you're squashing our dreams." 
Joe Torre. Uh, July 21st, 2008, Jose Reyes uh, becomes the franchise leader in triples. I mean, this is like his oh, three or four or five or six, seven, eight, I guess his fifth or sixth year as the starter. And he's already the franchise leader in triples. Um, put him one ahead of Mookie Wilson at only 25 years old. Oh, man, Jose Reyes, dude. Good God. I, you know, I don't know. I don't think they should have let him go, but then he gets into that, those personal troubles where he, domestic violence and whatnot. And it's like, I don't know. Not to say that the Mets have had like, like a, <laughs> a clean history of, you know, clean players who keep their heads out, keep their noses, <laughs> just keep out of trouble. Not to say that, but I think, uh, his legacy is forever tarnished and I, I don't think he's going to get the kind of treatment that he would have had that not gone down and rightfully so. But God damn you, Jose Reyes. Who would have thought that we'd have had Reyes and Wright and come away with zero in the World Series column? That just blows my mind. July 22nd, 1962. Uh, man, that's 62 season. Holy shit. The Mets managed to have four runners thrown out trying to score <laughs> <laughs> four runners thrown out trying to score at home plate four i mean that third base coach has to be fired on the spot correct i mean it's got i mean the third by the third time that happens you got to go to the third base coach and say pump the fucking brakes dude record setting 120 losses that year yeah 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 but it was the beginning of something special i guess uh july 22nd 1966 mets left fielder Ron Swoboda learns he's a new dad at Dodger Stadium. I thought this was, you know, it's kind of corny, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fucking cornball. I, you know, whatever. I own it. On the scoreboard at Dodger Stadium, it says, congratulations, Ron Swoboda. Your new son is born tomorrow morning because it was 10.05 p.m. in Los Angeles and it was 1.05 a.m. the next day in New York. Gave birth to... Uh, their first child, a son named Chipper. And then, of course, what happens? Chipper Jones is born and becomes a Mets killer. Oof. That was actually the name of the dog with anxiety, Chip. I had a friend in high school named Chip. Solid dude. Then I think about Chip from Cable Guy. I don't know. It's a mixed bag. That same day, 1986. This one is... I almost can picture this watching this happen. Maybe not live, but like in highlight tapes or something. Mets Reds, which that was a huge rivalry in the eighties that I wish still existed. Mets Reds, Mets Cardinals was big back then as well and continued not as much today. It's here and there. There's that whole pond scum, uh, fiasco that happened on scum such a weird put down anyway Mets Reds huge bench clearing brawl strawberries ejected Ray Knight's ejected Kevin Mitchell is ejected <laughs> Ray Knight apparently punched Eric Davis at third base so amazing um, but the Mets run out of position players so they're forced to put Gary catcher Gary Carter at third and they had Roger McDowell playing left and Jesse Orozco, I guess, in right. And then Mookie kind of just bouncing around out there. And so when a righty, right-handed batter comes up, McDowell comes in. And when a left-handed batter comes up, Orozco comes in. So there's only two outfielders, essentially, at any given time. Mookie and then the other relief pitcher. <sighs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. They probably still won that game too. It's amazing. Here's a, here's one that is a real kick in the dick. July 23rd, 2000, Barry Larkin famed Reds shortstop. And this, this probably feeds into the old Mets Reds rivalry. He's 36 at the time. He rejected a trade to the Mets. That would have been three years, 27 million. 
and he stayed in Cincy. And instead, the Mets uh, got 34-year-old Mike Bordick from the Orioles, I believe. And uh, Bordick went on to get outplayed by Melvin Mora and Kurt Abbott and flat out fucking stunk in the playoffs. This was after Ray Ordonez went down with an injury. I forget what the injury was, but he was out for like the remainder of the season. <sighs> Mets fans, dear God. If the, if the Mets get Barry Larkin in that 2000 postseason, they win the World Series, hands down, for sure. How life could be different if the Mets got Larkin in 2000. Yeah, so that was uh, this week in Mets history. It's it's kind of bittersweet looking back. <laughs> you know, it's going to it's like it's like, you know, hey, we're not alone. The Mets have been this way for so long. So it's kind of nice to reminisce about like all the other times that they've somehow got screwed over or fucked themselves over. Um, so it's like, all right, this is just who we are. We're cursed. Now, as far as this past week for the Mets, highest of the highs and lowest of the lows. They sweep the, ten, the Twins, which I don't even know how you can call that a sweep, first of all. It's two games. I feel like for it to be called a sweep, it has to be three games that you win in a row, but two games, it's like, I don't know. Mini sweep? What do you even call it? And I feel like Mets fans, delusional Mets fans, like myself, who, for some reason, watch this fucking circus every year right around this time in july something happens something goes right we get hot and we start to believe we think here we go we're turning it around we sweep the twins one of the best teams in american league top of the central division they're gonna end up playing the yankees at some point probably in the alcs stick it to them we, we gut out a nice 3-2 win with Diaz, making things interesting. And then we pummel them, put up double-digit runs. You know, Alonzo puts a ball in the fucking stratosphere. It was the, uh, I think apparently it was like the longest home run in the stat cast era, which I love that they call it the stat cast era. It's, you know, in four years. Let's pump the brakes on the era talk. Um... And they're riding high going into San Francisco. I don't think I've ever seen this happen, but we lose three of four in San Francisco, all in the extra innings, all on walk-offs. I mean, can it get any messier than that? No, it can't. I mean, 16 innings, Bumgarner takes it to him hard. Give San Francisco nine innings and prop what might be his last appearance as a, in a Giants uniform. Alonzo, there are rumors that, you know, everyone's there's talk about him going into a curse after the home run derby, which happens to everyone. And then getting up in the 16th, there are a chance of overrated going on at, at like would have been what three, two, three in the morning Eastern time. There's like no one at the ballpark, but those two guys that are pretty <laughs> pumped to get a jab in at Pete Alonzo, and he puts it in the stands. 2 1. Our bullpen has been so, I can't believe I'm going to say this, has been so good over those extra inning frames. We got a great start out of, might have been Noah, seven innings, which is what we need. Bullpen holds it together somehow over the course, over the next fucking nine innings you can't give us three more outs god damn it and just when chris mazza gets in your good graces he fucking shits all over it i i, I obviously didn't stay up to watch the game god help you if you did thoughts and prayers but jesus i saw the next day i'm like oh alonzo hits a game winning home run two one Oh, no. They blew it in the bottom of the 16th. I mean, just like, holy shit. And just when, and of course, I read a tweet from, I think, Good Fundies, good Twitter account to follow if you're a Mets fan, about Dom Smith. How, uh, how confident are we in Dom Smith? How comfortable are we with Dom Smith in the outfield? And 60 plus percent of fans who took the poll were like, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, 
doesn't hurt us. It's not great. He's not saving runs, but he's not costing us runs. And then we lose an extras because he drops a fucking fly ball. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm superstitious as fuck. And I got to blame that tweet for that loss. And then, you know, DeGrom gives us an amazing start. Wasted. I think he went seven innings pitching outstanding ball. He gets the loss. Syndergaard, uh, so he didn't get no decision. Syndergaard, no decision. And, and then Walker, Texas Ranger Lockett comes on the bump, and you're like, here's a loss. Here's where we lose. And sure enough, the offense explodes. 11-4. Sure, why not? And then the very next game, a 3-2 loss in extras. From, a, from Carl Yastrzemski's long-lost grandson or something like that. Just sticks his bat out and gets out of the stadium. I mean, that stinks. You know, would love to run a simulation without the juiced balls to see where we are. But, you know, you want to talk about getting your hopes up. How can I not get my hopes up after a series like that? Yeah, we lost three or four to the Giants, who have won 15 of the last 18. So they're a hot team, and we stuck it to them, and we almost swept them. And if we sweep them, we're closer to 500. We're only three or four games back in the wild card. So what is it? You know, I have I'm reading articles that they're not one or two players away or one or two transactions away. Kind of feels like they are. It really does. Feels like the offense is gelling. Everyone stays healthy. Everyone keeps hitting. We're good. We just need shut down bullpen. And the bullpen has been performing above expectations. I mean, the fact that they were able to hold it together for so long and extras is a testament to how far they've come. But they're always just like one pitch away from being an above average team that can compete with anyone. And of course, now they got the, uh, well, you know, the giants have won 15 to the last 18. The Mets are 15 and 18 in one run games. I mean, that's essentially the difference right now. You win most of those one run games and we're in the hunt. That's why I don't think this is a, a, like people are shitting all over them and saying the Mets are awful or atrocious, horrible. We're in a lot of 33 one run games. We're in a lot of games. You just need to find a way to win it. We have the Padres and, and uh, Pirates up next, next two series. They have similar records to the Mets. Who knows, dude? Who knows? I don't know if this was debilitating, demoralizing this giant series. Maybe it's emboldening if that's a word and they stick it to the Padres. I think that's at home. They might be playing at Pittsburgh, but regardless, you know, these next two weeks, it's either, you know, shut it down or let's get the fucking motivation going again. Saw this tweet and I, I don't know if I agree with it, but I don't hate it said Michael Conforto is not a bust. He's not an all-star. He's Kevin McReynolds. 20-something homers, 80-something RBIs, 2-something, 260-something average. You know, I don't hate those numbers. I also was a big Kevin McReynolds fan, so maybe that's why I'm not as put off as most people were by it. I don't think you should give up on Conforto just yet. But, you know, if he is that Kevin McReynolds type of player, is that so bad? I don't mind having that in the outfield. It's just you don't want to overpay for it. Yeah, and then like, you know, and this was the tweet that lost them the game. Dom Smith had 183 innings in left field. To those of you who have watched him, how is he out there? Most people thought he was passable. Then he, just, then he fucking dropped that ball. Cost us the game. So people are still talking about Travis Darno, which drives me nuts. There was a uh, article, I don't know where, it said Travis Darno epitomizes huge Mets flaw that needs to end, basically TLDR. The need to recognize their near-term success and failure is not about one or two moves. I disagree, but the process is to create thoroughness and consistency, which I do agree with. I do. Just a lack of consistency across the board. 
you know, why do you bring back, why do you tender Travis Darno before the season than bring in Wilson Ramos? And we're on the hook for 3.5 million or something like that. Can't trade him to the Dodgers. I love people who just drive to, or like ride a bike down the street and yell at each other. Just amazing. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like we try, we had the opportunity to maybe trade him to the Dodgers. We don't Dodgers pick him up, turn around, trade him to the race. And you know, the Rays and Dodgers, they get it. They're putting together winning teams. You know, we rushed him back from rehab. I totally forgot about that. The fact that, you know, he needed more time to heal and, and get better. And we just forced him back into action, which I mean, we need to get someone on this, tr this training staff with any kind of medical expertise to, to give better diagnoses and prognoses. It's absurd how they fuck up injured players, just the rehab assignments, everything. What is going on with Jed Lowry? Is he still alive? Holy shit. Here's a Pete Alonzo factoid. 15 of Pete Alonzo's 32 home runs have either tied the game or given the Mets the lead this season. Woohoo! He also broke the Mets rookie run, uh, rookie RBI record. Um, I, you know, the home run derby curse. I don't believe it with this guy. I just don't, you know, I know his numbers are down, but I still think he's going to battle and he's going to come back. It was a blip on the radar. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, talk about moving on, getting closure, moving on, common theme of this episode. We're still writing about Jared Kalenic and, and Justin Dunn, whatever the fuck his name is. It's gotten to the point where Jared Kalenic's mom was like, is sick of hearing about from the New York sports media about her son. You know, her quote was, you broke up with him. Yeah. We did. So let's all just collectively take a deep breath. Q Taylor Swift's we're never, ever, ever getting back together and move on. What other prospects are in the field? Let's get back in the hunt, get back in the game. And you want to talk about a typical Mets move? Matt Harvey designated for assignment by the angels. Should the Mets bring him back and put him in the bullpen? Probably not. But the Mets love bringing back old Mets that had some kind of sentimental value. I mean, they did it with Jason Isringhausen, who started off as a starter with the Mets and then came back in the bullpen. And he did an okay job. Maybe Harvey has a second life in the bullpen. I don't fucking know, dude. I just move on. Let's get past it. I mean, take a flyer. I don't know. I don't know at this point. I mean, I guess there aren't that many arms going around. So, you know, if he comes on low cost, maybe he has something to prove. Maybe, he, I don't know. I, I doubt it. Seriously. And then there was this article, which, you know, I almost led with this in the intro, but I think it's disingenuous. And it's just going to cause you to hate me as, as I did with this article, the title is how the New York Tr Mets can win the MLB trade deadline. I'm thinking someone's cracked the code. Someone knows what to do. Someone's got the secret sauce. How do you not click on that? And I click on it. And of course it's clickbait that how the Mets can win the MLB trade deadline. Hold on to Zach Wheeler not trade Thor or Diaz and just deal Frazier and or Vargas go fuck yourself. Unbelievable. It, the Mets do that. And, and you have zero people saying they won the trade deadline. Give me a break. That's how low the bar is for the Mets to win anything. <laughs> I don't know. I think Wheeler ends up with the, I, I don't know. I don't, I can't, I don't want him to go to the Yankees. I'd much rather have him on the Red Sox, but apparently the Brewers have always been interested in him, so maybe he ends up there finally. Apparently Thor is not a fit in San Diego, even though they just lost a starter. I don't know. 
know, do you want to hold it like rebuild or, or what? I don't think dealing Thor and Wheeler is a rebuild per se. Depends on what you get back. You got to get something really good back for Thor. It's something of value for Zach Wheeler. But I get it. If we're not in a rebuild, then we hold on to both and, and hope that they somehow become Cy Young winners in 2020. Whatever, dude. All right. Let's uh, round out the show with the Giants. Of course, the, st- the top story is uh, OBJ's GQ feature, which came out uh, yesterday, Monday, July 22nd. Um, I have some bullet points here. We'll run through them quickly. He thought about retiring at 24, which is absurd. But I think that's just kind of the new generation of football players. It's like, I'm young. I have money. Why do I want to risk my body, my reputation, my brand for what? For fans that don't appreciate me, which isn't true, OBJ. We do. There's a small sect of people, probably older, who don't get you, don't get what you're about, and thought you were a cancer. And ultimately, this ties back into... it. it It's relatable for anyone who's worked a day in their lives. If you are talented and skilled and do well at your position, but you don't get along with your boss, GM, whatever, ownership, you don't get along with your your colleagues, coworkers, not to say that he did. He definitely got along with all the players in the clubhouse. There's that friction. You're not happy. And so your performance suffers. So I can I can completely understand where he's coming from on that. Passionate guy that wants to win, wants to succeed. And maybe that gets the best of him sometimes. He shows his emotion, he gets emotional. Would you rather have that? Or you have someone who I guess is more like Eli, just super even keel to the point where it's can be infuriating how like after a loss he's just flatlining. But Eli's won two Super Bowls. OBJ, one playoff loss. He ends up talking about the playoff loss too, saying that he was only he felt disrespected. And uh, the playoff loss is a is a is an example of how he's disrespected. He only had seven targets in the playoff game. Here's the deal, man. I mean, when you're playing with Eli and he goes to you early on or in the first half a few times and you don't catch the ball. You drop the ball, his trust in you, his confidence in you completely eroded. And he won't go back to you. He'll find someone who will catch the ball. That's just who he is. I think that's, that should be pretty understandable for most quarterbacks and players in the league. Are you really going to go back, keep going back to the well when it's not working out? And that's probably why I only got seven targets. Then again, everyone was dropping the fucking ball in that game. So it's like, I don't know, just keep on coming right, coming right back working through everyone and coming back to him. I don't know. This respect is tough though. Cause it's like, we did give you, the giants gave you the monster contract, the largest contract in NFL history. How is that disrespect? And he says he doesn't have any, uh, a beef or problem with Mara, but that he had a problem with Gettleman. And this has been the common theme. We've been, we've been hearing this from players that have left or been traded or let walk or whatever. Landon Collins being another one. They have problems with Gettleman. Gettleman has a vision. You don't fit into that vision for whatever reason. That's not saying you're not talented. That's not saying you're not worth the money. But he's looking at you as a piece of the puzzle. And if your piece doesn't fit into the rest of the puzzle, you got to move on. Now Landon Collins is saying he can't even use the, he can't even say the team's name, the Giants. Is that really what's going on here? You were beloved. And now you're going to, you know, and part of it's, I don't know. I mean, blame Gettleman all you want. Someone has to be the bad guy in this situation. And the way that they're handling it is probably not the right way. Obviously, OBJ didn't get along with Shermer. You know, I didn't have a problem with his interview uh, on ESPN with Lil Wayne. I mean, it bothered me a little bit, but I thought, you know what? He needs to vent. He needs to get it out there, get it out there and let's move on. Keep it going. 
Yeah, it's kind of fucked up that we gave him the largest contract in NFL history for a wide receiver. And then he turns around, does that, kind of throws Eli under the bus. So yeah, you got to find people that work in the system. Sterling Shepard works within the system. Now, was OBJ a negative influence on Sterling? Someone somewhere higher up thought so. They were like, we like this guy. We think that he can be more of the kind of player that works better within our environment, within our ecosystem. Let's give him the extension. Let's trade OBJ. And let's bring in Golden Tate, who we think is a better fit. OBJ, Golden Tate, big personalities. But does Golden Tate's personality take away from the team? Or it can be perceived as a distraction. You know, and OBJ said he's been treated unfairly. That guys like Gronk are doing what he does, sometimes worse than what he does. But Gronk is is has this uh, this air of being very lovable, likable, big doof, goofy doofus kind of guy that uh, you know everyone loves. Tom Brady, another example he gave. And that's why I think he really wanted to end up with the Patriots. He cited Gronk and Brady. He mentioned the Patriots later on. And if, if this was really disrespectful to the Giants, or to OBJ, I don't think the Giants would have traded him to the, to the Browns. Yeah, the Browns have a history of being a shitty team. Cleveland as a city, this is not me talking, not ranked very highly among the NFL cities that players want to go to. But it's now becoming a destination for players because they're building a nice little team. I mean, they're talking Super Bowl in Cleveland. So they didn't trade into a shit town with a shit roster. that has no chance of making the playoffs. Not the 99 Browns, the 2019 Browns with Baker Mayfield, Colin Signals, his best friend, Jarvis Landry. I mean, they put him in a pretty decent situation to succeed and win like he wants to do. So I don't know that it was that disrespectful. Was it handled perfectly? No, by no means. But I mean, you got to cut the ties at some point. I mean, if you were to ask Shermer and Gettleman, you know, inject him with truth serum, they're going to say he's the best player they've ever seen. But does he help you win games? The whole point of the game is to win games and they weren't able to deal with him for whatever reason. I mean, honestly, if the team had a defense, who knows where the Giants are? Maybe OBJ is still on the team. It's all about the team, the unit. No one's blaming OBJ for all those losses. That's not the case. Problem is, you're paying a lot of money for a star player who wants to win, but given the financial constraints, the dynamic of the roster, not able to happen. And they need, and I said this in one of the articles I wrote about him, he's a high value chip. Can you get multiple pieces back for him that can help you out as a team? They're not going to be once in a lifetime players, but they're going to be somewhat above average and they fill a need. And I feel like they did that. Kevin Zeitler, Jabril Peppers, you know, they were able to get multiple guys back that immediately make you a better team. How much better? We don't, we don't know. We won't know. But you got to be better than 5 and 11. And, you know, he, in the article, he talks about how he wants to surpass Jerry Rice's 23,000 receiving yards. He wants to play till he's 36, 37. From what I've seen and heard, he takes tremendous care of his body. That being said, he's now missed significant playing time the past two years. Almost all of 2017, the latter part of 2018. Dude, you got to stay on the field. For paying you all that money, you got to stay on the field. And, you know, the injuries are out of your hands a lot of times. But we need depth. And the only way we, we could have got it was... By moving you. And it sucks because I agree with a lot of what he says. And I don't, don't agree with a lot, but I agree with some of what he says. We didn't sign him to trade him. We didn't. But when we sign you to that monster contract and you're during the season, 
before even the season started, you're saying that you wanted to change. You wanted out. You can't do this anymore. You can't do it. You weren't happy. You weren't in a good place. You're talking about Los Angeles in that little lane interview. He's asking, he's asking himself, why did we even sign this contract? What did we sign this for? And that's what he felt during the season. He didn't felt, he didn't feel like it felt long-term. So why, if he has that feeling and he wanted to retire at 24, even though he wants to win, it's just not going to work out. And it's best to part ways. So no, they didn't sign him to trade him. They signed him thinking, here's our vote of confidence to you. Yeah, they only gave it one year. But you see what happens in that one year. Shit, a lot of shit can change in one year. So, I don't know. I mean, there was one, there was, uh, just to round out the bullet points, there was the interviewer asked him about the, the whole rumors about him being gay. And he had a very interesting quote that I think is important to kind of pull out. He says, it's like when someone gives me an ultimatum, I'm usually always going to go to the opposite way of what you want me to go. Feels like the Giants gave him an ultimatum or what could be perceived as an ultimatum. And it made him whoop, totally lose interest and want to get out. And yeah, that's on the coach. That's on the GM. And the owners are kind of, to a certain degree, they're paying the GMs and the coaches to make the just tough decisions and to justify those decisions to them. And ultimately the owners have the, the last, and, and you know, Mara's talked about this, how he received amazing, an incredible amount of letters and feedback from fans being like, you made the wrong decision. Why'd you do that? Threatening to pull away their season tickets. It's a risky move, but I think it was the right move. If you have a situation like that, that that feels untenable, that feels like it's not repairable, I mean, you, you're going to get rid of Gentleman that quickly. You're going to get rid of Shermer already. And you can see who they cater to. They cater to Eli. Why? For a guy that's on the tail end of his career, they want to get him that third Super Bowl. Send him off on a high note. And they were willing to sacrifice the greatest, possibly the, if he stays healthy, the greatest receiver in NFL history. The problem is he's not as much care as he takes with his body. I just don't see him lasting another 10 years. I just don't see it. And here's another quote that from the article. This one was a quite an answer to a question about the media back backlash, but also specifically the backlash from black media. He says, yes, it makes it worse when it comes from the black community. I feel like everything is a double standard. You want us to support the black community. And then you go out and bash black people for being happy. So someone can't be happy. Someone can't be dancing. <laughs> It's tough, especially in this in day and age. I mean, you know, I, I always make this comparison to Lawrence Taylor, but like if Lawrence Taylor played in the Twitter era, Instagram era, would he have played as well as he did? Would he tune it out? And, you know, Odell keeps saying that he's he's not. He's, he doesn't succumb to that, but yet he keeps mentioning it, which makes me think he does care about it. And if he was really focused, completely shut it all down. You can see his head is a little, and this is what makes him such an interesting character is like, he's so focused on football as diehard football, passionate, but then he's thinking about retiring at 24. He's thinking about what if I went to another sport, which he's just, I mean, he's the, one of the best athletes I've ever seen in my life, hitting home runs in batting practice, crushing the ball in golf. Like there's nothing he can't do basketball all around a superb athlete, but he's questioned and that's human to have, to, to doubt yourself and have questions, but you know, football is life for Tom Brady. Football is life. So, you know, of course he's the way he talks, you're going to question his dedication, but then you see everything he does and yeah, he really wants to win. So I wasn't angry 
I didn't want to read the article, first of all, because this plays back into it's kind of like when you break up with your significant other, your partner, and you're like, I'm not going to. I'm not going to like check in on them. And then you end up doing it and you end up caving in and, and looking at their article or looking at their pictures on Facebook. And it's like the best method for me has been just block, block them. You know, they're not a bad person, but you have to block them just for your own health, for your own sanity. And I think that's what the Giants fans had to do with OBJ. Block them out. Just get them out of your head. Move on. I think a lot of Giants fans are on par, on on the same wavelength with that. I think it's like, why do we keep talking about him? He's gone. I, he probably will never, he's never going to come back. Wish him the best of luck. Thank God he's not in our division, like Landon Collins, because that's going to be a thorn in our side. Even though I think we have a game plan to beat him, he's still going to come up with some plays that are going to make us nostalgic. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a business. And I think Landon and OBJ say that they're sad. It's, they're sad it's a business, but then they're also taking it personally. So it's tough, especially when, when with the Giants. You know, I think most teams, uh, you don't see players respond like this. You know, because I think they did believe in the Giants and they wanted it to work. And it didn't for whatever reason. I mean, both of those guys... Uh, I would have laid down serious cash that they would have ended up in as giants, lifelong giants. But, you know, it's a balance of like, you can get along with your, your, co your coworkers, your colleagues in the clubhouse. And that's, what's weird is like Gettleman wants to build a team culture and building the team. And that's what, you know, Bob Papa says that that's what the difference is with this team. Those guys, Collins and OBJ, were on board with that and felt like they were, they were helping to build that team culture. And yet here we are. It's about the team. Uh, of course, this leads me to Baker Mayfield's comment on OBJ. And it's like, uh, all of a sudden, you know, I was such a huge Baker Mayfield fan from, you know, him recreating that photo of Brett Favre with the fanny pack and jean shorts to everything he does. It just seems like he's sticking it to Colin Cowherd. And it's like, I'm, a, I was completely in his camp. And then he comes out with this on OBJ. He's here to play in front of fans who actually care, who will actually show up to every game and pack the stadium and love him for who he is. I mean, go oh, fuck yourself. Like, why, dude? Why you gotta poke the bear? Huh? I hope we do meet you in the Super Bowl and we'll fucking destroy you, dude. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, before this comment and even after this comment, I want to see them do well. I want to see Cleveland. I'm sick of seeing fucking Pittsburgh at the top of that division going to the playoffs every year. Couldn't be happier that Pittsburgh is collapsing. Or it appears to be collapsing. Who knows? Definitely need a change of the guard in the AFC uh, North. And I, I want to see them end that Super Bowl drought for sure. A part of me now wants to see them <laughs> just explode, implode, spontaneously combust. I mean, you're coming after like Giants fans, dude. Do you know the fucking waiting list to get on to get season tickets for the fucking Giants? I waited my entire life, 30 plus years to get on that fucking waiting list. I don't even know if I'm still on it. It's just absurd. And yeah, you turn into a lot of these games in November and December when the Giants have been officially eliminated from the playoffs. And yeah, the stadium is as empty as it gets. I think that's also a byproduct of the fact that they have been so bad for six years now, seven years. You start to see the team come undone. You start to see the team give up. How do you go to, to the, if anything, that is a gesture from the fans to the ownership. We do not support this team. Good fans do that. I know that sounds weird. You would think good fans show up rain or shine, no matter what. Nah, dude. And this is what New York sports fans get correct. You got to call out people. You got to make them accountable. You got to let them know, hey, this shit ain't cutting it. You want us to pay fucking more than $100 per ticket to see you play? 
pay for parking, all that shit to come to the game. We're not gonna we're not gonna pay for this quality of play. It's holding the team accountable. And the only, hit the owner where it hurts in the fucking wallet. Your team plays well. We reward you big time. You win a Super Bowl. The wallet, the Venmo's open, my man. The cash is coming at you hard and fast. I mean, if he's saying Browns fans are better than Giants fans. Yeah. All right. Maybe. I mean, there are attendance numbers that prove otherwise, but if you are a Browns fan, I mean, more power to you, especially if you're old enough to remember when they went to the playoffs and won. More power to you. You are a better man than I, because I don't know. A lot, a lot of people would have given up on your team, on your franchise. So, I mean, just, I don't know. Why, it's like, the fans... You gonna blame the fucking fans? I mean, it's a troll job for the ages, right there. So I wouldn't mind seeing Baker get knocked around a couple times this year. Here's a question of the day: Which New York Giants rookie do you believe will have the biggest impact on the team's 2019 season, and why? All I gotta say: DeAndre Baker, uh, third. Draft pick for the Giants this past year. Uh, at the end of uh, round one, they came traded back into round one to get him. I think he's going to give us superior play at the corner position. He's going to make mistakes, obviously, because he's a rookie, but it'll be nice to have him opposite of Janoris Jenkins for sure. Uh, you're remiss if I didn't mention Mitch Petrus, who, you know, this heat wave, you know, I joke around, but uh, it took his life. He had a heat stroke, died at the age of 32, um, was a member of the 2011 Super Bowl team. Very likable guy, beloved by teammates. It's unfortunate to see. Um, yeah, that heat wave. I saw like some polls on Twitter about like, what would you rather have? Temperatures that are 90 to 110 or 40 to 60. I, you know, I know he passed, but I, I don't know. I think I'd rather be in 90 to 100. I'm a lazy guy, so like you go outside and sweat off all that poundage. Don't have to do anything. I was playing cornhole. I think I lost about five pounds on Saturday. Um, so really quickly, I'll run through these last few things. Giants looking at Jonathan Cyprian, 27-year-old. Played for Jacksonville and Tennessee. Strong safety tackling machine, over 100 tackles per season. Um, and they're looking at Trey Boston, 26-year-old. Played for Carolina, the Chargers, uh, Cardinals. More of like a free safety ball hawk um, for, the, uh, for the safety spot that was kind of abandoned by Cameron Moore, who was arrested. I guess Trey Boston is the better of the two. Although I always thought Jabril Peppers would be the ball hawk. I'd much rather have Cyprian, who's like the tackling machine, or we need sure tacklers in the secondary that can bring guys down and don't fucking ole the ball carrier like goddamn Curtis Riley. <sighs> anyway, USA Today predicts Giants finish will finish with five eleven record. Go fuck yourself, USA Today. Um. Ox and Daniel Jones signed the rookie contracts, which is good. Don't know the details yet. So maybe have, have cramped any kind of possibility for bringing in free agents that can make an impact. We'll have to see giants are not on any Sunday night football games this season. Uh, as it is, as it currently stands, Art Stapleton, who I love and follow. He said, this is a big statement. It's about appeal. Disagree, my man. I am very excited to not see the Giants on Sunday Night Football. And I don't think they're on Monday Night Football, but maybe they are. I hope they're not on Monday Night Football. The Giants stink on primetime at a national level. Stink with a capital K. So I'm very excited to see that they're not playing any of those primetime games. Because that means we'll actually win. So I like our chances now that we're not playing any primetime games. Um, and I'll leave with this. What would you define as a successful 2019 season? A winning record. I think that's success. 
you know, I, I every year I say that they're going to, it seems like I always predict 10 and six uh, with a playoff, with a wild card berth. And I'm not going to say that this year. I will say that they will be in a lot of games, a handful of games, and they will make things interesting and competitive like they pretty much always do. And fans will show up and they'll be excited about the 2020 season. And I think that's successful. I think that's success for us. Building on last year, knowing that we had some good moments, continuing to build on it, and flirting, teasing with the playoffs. I think we're going to be in the hunt in December and we're going to ultimately fall short. Um, and you'll see the send off of all send offs for Eli in his final home game. We didn't get him to the three, three lie prophecy didn't come to fruition, but so it goes, it's time to get some closure and move on. And so we'll move on. That was another fucking monster episode i gotta do this multiple times per week that's pretty obvious so godspeed to obj baker mayfield i hope you get hit by a truck in the form of a large defensive end and to everyone else adios muchachos